Good morning, saints of our Lord, and welcome to Thy Strong Word. I'm your host, Pastor Brady Finner, and District President of the Minnesota North District of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. Thank you for tuning us in this morning on Worldwide KFU Will. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. A blessed Pentecost this Monday, July the 11th, live from the LCMS Youth Gathering in Houston, Texas, which is our time where we say the theme for our gathering this year is in all things from Colossians chapter one, reminding us that Christ is in all things. All things were created by him. He's the one who holds it all together. And this is a great reminder today as we study Genesis chapter 30. It's one of those texts that we didn't quite expect to be doing at a youth gathering. Wouldn't you agree? my guess here. <laughs> you would agree with that. But yet it is actually a good reminder for us of many things of why we need a Savior. So let's dig in, open up your Bibles, put on your Christ goggles for the gifts are ready, ready for you. Thank you to our friends at Lutheran Heritage Foundation for your support of Thy Strong Word. Visit lhfmissions.org for more information, lhfmissions.org. Helping us to be strengthened by God's Word this morning, and actually the first time as host of Thy Strong Word that I've had somebody in studio with me. I've usually done it in my own office, all by myself. No one's looking at me. There's no people walking around. But first time, and this is a joy to have you with us, is Pastor Joshua Canippa of Holy Cross Lutheran Church in Nederland, Texas. Pastor Canepa, welcome back to Thy Strong Word. Thank you, Pastor Finner. Glad to be here on Worldwide KFUO. Glad to be at the youth gathering here in Houston. Uh, very excited to be with you. Uh, glad to be live in person. Like you said, this is a really fun. It's been a long time since I've done in-person live radio. So uh, I'm looking forward to our time together. Absolutely. And I've noticed, and if you notice my voice, and I think yours as well, and our, our beloved other friend here, uh, Andy Bates, our voices are not quite the same. Why is that? Any ideas? Well, there's been a lot of talking and or, yeah, I don't want to say yelling at kids, but uh, yeah. sometimes it's loud and you have to uh, <laughs> share your the things you have to share with your kids in a, a more elevated tone. And so uh, we've been doing a little bit of that, but all of it's good and all of it's fun. And uh, it, it just uh, this event is such a blessing for those kids. And it's a blessing for the leaders and, and everybody else as well. I'm, I'm very uh, appreciative of all the work that's done by the folks uh, in the office. Uh, Mark Kiesling, the head of our youth ministry here in the Missouri Synod and everybody else who works with him to put on this event. Uh, it is overwhelming to just see everything that's happening and, and all of that and such a, such a neat deal. And as we mentioned, the theme for this year is In All Things, reminding us of identity. That's one of the great things I've noticed is continually reminding our young people in a world that tells you should have tons of identities. This is my truth, and as opposed to knowing the truth of Christ being in all things and living in us as our Savior and saving us from our sins. And so, Pastor, there's also another important aspect to this, that we are in Texas. And you are a Texan. If I'm, You're a Texan, right? You're not, Correct. You're not a Minnesotan? No, no. you're a Texan. Okay. So what do you want everyone to know about the state of Texas? Real quickly here. I know it's good. it could take an hour, but give me quick. What yeah, do you want I, everyone to know? I would use more time if you would give it to me. But uh, <laughs> I would just say uh, uh, Texas is a great place. There's a lot of just great things to do here, great people to meet. Uh, one of my favorite things about Texas is it is the home of my alma mater, uh, Concordia University, Texas, uh, where I graduated from. And I always encourage the kids uh, in the area of when they're thinking about where to go to college and all these kinds of things, I always like to tell them, hey, if you go to Concordia, Texas, and are in church work, you get to have a college reunion every three years at the National Youth Gathering mm. and get to see all of your friends and, and people you knew from college and, and for us also, friends from seminary and everything. And it's just uh, it's a neat deal and a fun time. Well, now we know. I, I now regret that I did not go to Concordia, Texas. What do you think about that? It would have been great to have you there. Uh, we would have accepted you. Uh, and uh, certainly uh, glad uh, that we're able, though, to be here together today. And that's why we're here. We're here to be in God's Word. So, Pastor, as we are looking at Genesis chapter 30, um, well, we're, I think we're going to need the Lord's help as we look at this text today. So can you begin our time in prayer? I'd love to. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. I thank you, Lord, for this event. I thank you for KFUO and their uh, willingness to broadcast from here, and uh, it's a blessing. And so uh, I ask, Lord, that 
our study together would be a blessing for our hearers and for the folks here. Uh, we commend our time to you. In Jesus' good name, amen. Amen. If you have any questions concerning our text today, um, I'm just going to ask people from here at, at uh, the youth gathering if they're going to have any questions. We'll try to pump it up as we go. We'll see. We'll have uh, Sarah and, and James ask people as they walk by. I'm sure they all are just wondering. I'm wondering about Genesis 30, verse 13. I'm sure they're all wondering that as they walk through this convention um, center. So as we do so, Pastor, uh, let's begin by looking at the Word of God. We're going to dig in because there's context. There's a lot of verses to get through. But this is a great text for us today, and I think it is appropriate for us as we do look at the youth gathering. So uh, let's begin. Uh, Genesis 30, we'll go verses 1 through 13 from the English Standard Version. We hear the word of God. When Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, she envied her sister. She said to Jacob, give me children or I shall die. Jacob answered, anger was kindled against Rachel, and he said, am I in the place of God? Who has withheld you from the fruit of the womb? Then she said, Here is my servant, Bilhah. Go into her so that she may give birth on my behalf, that even I may have children through her. So she gave him her servant, Bilhah, as a wife, and Jacob went into her. And Bilhah conceived and bore Jacob a son. Then Rachel said, God has judged me and has also heard my voice and given me a son. Therefore she called his name Dan. Rachel's servant Bilhah conceived and bore Jacob a second son. Then Rachel said, With mighty wrestling, wrestlings I have wrestled with my sister and have prevailed. So she called his name Naphtali. When Leah saw that she had ceased bearing children, she then took her servant Zilpah and gave her, gave her Jacob as a wife. Then Leah's servant Zilpah bore Jacob a son. And Leah said, Good fortune has come. So she called his name God. Gad, excuse me. Leah's servant Zilpah before bore Jacob a second son. And Leah said, Happy am I, for women have called me happy. So she called his name Asher. Now, Pastor, as we, as we hear these verses today, uh, give us some context because this sounds more like a bad soul opera than it does the inspired and narrated Jesus centered word of God. What do you got? Yeah, you ain't wrong. Uh, I tell you, it's. Uh, <laughs> Just to set the, the, the table briefly, we've got Jacob, who, and I kind of, when I go through this, I kind of look at some of the characters in terms of kind of archetypes, and we got Jacob, and he's kind of this total underachiever, he's a trickster, he's a deceiver, um, he uh, uh, isn't making much of his life, and he kind of gets sent away to his relative Laban, and uh, he meets Rachel, falls in love with her, and he wants to marry Rachel, then Laban, who is this kind of opportunist kind of guy, he turns the tables completely on, on Jacob, and uh, instead uh, he has Jacob labor for seven years, work for him for seven years, and says, yes, I will give you Rachel to be your wife after you work for me seven years. And then, by the way, on the wedding night, it's not Rachel, it's Leah. And so then he has to work seven more years to get the wife who he, the woman who he really loves, which is Rachel. And so now he's got two wives. And by the time we get to the end of this text here, he's also got two girlfriends, which is, that's a bad equation right there. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's one of those reminders too, when we read these stories in scripture that uh, they are often descriptive and not prescriptive. And that mm -hmm. is that they mm -hmm. tell us what happened. They don't say always, this is how it should go. Sometimes they do. But I would certainly say that in the case of Jacob and his uh, marital issues here, this is not something that says, go now and do likewise. But mm. instead, this is just kind of what happened. And, and it, it tells us that. And I think it shows us, too, that these guys in the Old Testament, they have their own foibles and shortcomings and mistakes and sin issues and problems, just like people do today. And so that's one thing that we can draw on is that, we see Jacob and Rachel and Leah and Laban and all of our other characters here. And then we see ourselves now and we can say, you know what? They needed a savior. And you know what? I need a savior. And it's a reminder for us as we read some of these stories that look like they maybe should be going on in a trailer park that uh, we, are, <laughs> we are reminded that uh, we are in need of Jesus as well. And as we look at this, it's interesting because we always think of Jacob as being the trickster, but he kind of met his match with his father-in-law. Laban kind of, um, 
Yeah, he met his match. Any thoughts on that? I never quite thought about these two guys um, kind of being the same par as tricksters. Yeah, and, you know, Jacob stole his birthright from his brother for, and, and did uh, other things <laughs> and has been kind of sleeping through life and, and playing the, the game where he's treating people like that and just kind of coasting and kind of making it through on his wits and everything. And then he, he does meet his match with Laban. He turns the tables on him. And uh, does so more than once, not just in this case. And so it's uh, very interesting that uh, Jacob gets his comeuppance and, uh, <laughs> you know, meets meet somebody who uh, who can go go uh, toe-to-toe. Toe-to-toe, with to toe. Yeah. absolutely. It, it's much like a Texas A&M-Texas game, is it not? I mean, kind of back and forth and, and toe-to-toe? What do you think? Yeah, it could be. Uh, Texas <laughs> leads the uh, all-time series about 2-1, to one, but if you look at the more recent years, it's different, but uh, we'll see. They may be uh, putting that all back together again, so we'll see. Yeah, what happens I, I thought we'd road. get some cheers from the crowd, but there's no cheers for the Texas Texas A&M game. Anyways, we tried. So, Pastor, as we talked about that, it is as we talk about a lot of times here on KFUO and Dice Wrong Word. You put on your Christ goggles. It is very clear from this that we need to have Jesus-centered goggles as we read this these verses. So, so let's just kind of look at this, break this down, verses one through thirteen, because it can be very confusing as who's dating who, who's married to who, where is the children, all this stuff. So uh, break this down. We have Rachel, we got Leah, we got uh, Bilha, we got Zilpa. Tell us the story and, and the, the, the problems, uh, problems, many problems. Well, kind of as we said, you know, Jacob, the uh, wife of his love is Rachel. And, you know, come to find out, Rachel is unable to bear children. And we have the same kind of thing going on with Leah. And so they do this thing with their servants. And back in that culture time, if you ran into that kind of situation, you know, the family line must be preserved. And so they would do this thing with servants or, watch out for it, handmaids uh, who would bear the children and carry forward the family line. Uh, mm-hmm. And actually, it, when, we, was I, when I was assigned this chapter, I yeah. read this part and I was like, oh, there's a pop cultural tie in here because... They quote this part of Genesis 30 uh, in that book and in that show, which we can't recommend because it's not very sanctified. But uh, certainly it's something that is out there in the zeitgeist a little bit. Oh, I see. I never, I never thought about that. And, and so there's, there's some cultural precedent with this. So it's not like I can't believe they would ever do that in those days. But definitely it's not, it's not something where this goes that, back to that descriptive and prescriptive dynamic is that you're looking at it and you're going, huh, um, this is in there, but it's definitely not prescribed, and it never ends well. When there's multiple wives, when there's servants involved, it never ends well in Holy Scripture. Any, well, why would that be? Why doesn't it end well, Pastor Kenneth? Well, I tell you, because, and when we say that they were taking some cues from some other cultures in that day and time, they're taking cues from cultures that are not, they're not believers. You know, they don't believe in the God of the Bible. And so they're going down paths that God has called his people onto different paths than what they are going down. Because what God has um, prescribed from the first couple of chapters of the Bible is one man, one woman, one flesh, one lifetime. And that Mm. is uh, marriage as God has given it to us uh, as a great gift. Uh, And instead of doing that, and part of it's Jacob, and part of it's Laban, and and part of it's Leah, and part of it's Rachel, uh, this family dynamic has decided uh, we appreciate the advice, Lord, but no. Nah. Let me tell you what's going on. I'll, I'll tell you better than you know yourself, God. And, and this is important for us, and I want to get to that. But let's go, let's go to a little bit of we see God at work even in the midst of this because there's children that we might recognize their names. So I wanted to kind of uh, precursor this, that there's some names here of these children that you might recognize later on in Scripture. And who are these sons um, as we prepare for future chapters in the scriptures. Yeah, and it is always a good thing to remember when you're going through Genesis is that it's a big reminder with each generation that we study in Genesis that children are a blessing. And even though we're having children here outside of the best setting and the setting as God has outlined it, uh, children are still a blessing. And so uh, we start here to have the sons of Jacob who are going to play a huge role in the coming chapters uh, here in Genesis. What, the next uh, 20 chapters or so we're going to be dealing with um, with those guys. And so we get uh, Reuben here, 
uh, who's the firstborn, right? I'm sorry, no, you're asking I'm sorry. questions here. Yeah, now you're yeah. asking me questions. <laughs> What's going on here? What we see is, is Ra- uh, ah, you got Rachel, um, we got Bill Ha, and we have... Yeah, Hawk, what, what, what's going on here? There's just a lot. Yeah, There's a lot of kids. I'm yeah, we sorry. Get, so yes, you Dan. It's okay. Yes. We the got first, Dan. The first one is Ruben. Is uh, Ruben. To, uh, to Leah. Leah. Yeah. Uh, and then, so we get him as the firstborn, and he'll come into play later in the more specifically in the Jacob story, in the Joseph story, rather. Uh, and then uh, we just start having these, these different kids and everything. But all the while, what Jacob really, you know, I'm projecting a little bit here, but what Jacob really wants is to have children with his beloved wife, Rachel. And mm. heretofore, that has not been what has happened. And we get this conversation, too, about uh, when wombs are open and when they are closed. And so God's hand is in this. And I think we can. We still believe that God can do this. Uh, right. This is why we pray. And so, um, it doesn't. It it's not. It doesn't start the way that God has said that these things should go. But ultimately, it's going to go forward. And you know, spoiler alert for the end of Genesis. But we get to over and over again the idea that that which you intended for evil, God used for good and for the saving of many lives. And that's ultimately where all this is going to take us with this family and their next generation. And it obviously leads us to the cross. You know, what the devil intended for evil, God used for good. Because that brings us salvation, forgiveness, life. And that's why we see the cross and we're able to look back and go, holy cow, God carried his people through all this. And by the way, you, are, you our listeners, know very well that I'm, I'm terrible at Bible trivia. So you're asking me about Reuben, all this. I'm like, wait a second. I'm trying to focus on 30. So come on now. No more Bible trivia type all right, questions, all right. all right? Problem solved? Okay, yeah. Pastor Fenner. <laughs> so, but we do see, and this is a common theme that we see throughout Genesis, is God carries his people through even the worst of situations. Noah obviously had his issues. We get to Abraham, which, by the way, do you want to sing Father Abraham at some point today, or are you, are you okay? Maybe we could get some of the kids to help uh, us. They're not stopping. They don't want to yeah, sing nothing. They, they sing all night, all day. So I don't think it's going to happen. <laughs> but anyways, um, so you have all of these situations where God is always carrying his people through, and we see it today. And then we'll see it with the 12 tribes, which then brings us to the Israelites, which obviously, how could that not then lead us to Christ, the new Israel, and we, the new Israel as well. Pastor, anything else in verses 1 through 13 as we continue on? No, it's just going there. I did find a, f- a couple of my little notes on some of the kids that we were mentioning earlier. Dan, his name means vindicated, which I always, you know this, I'm a nerd for the, what the, the meaning of the names because they usually yep. mean something, you they know. Do. Do. Um, Naphtali, his name means struggle, uh, and so we have that going on. Uh, then as well in verse uh, 10 and 11, uh, we see, or in 13, uh, rather, yep. when Leah says, uh, happy and I, they have called me happy. Uh, and so we get the name Asher, which is kind of cool. Uh, and then also when... Um, in there, verse 11, mm-hmm. when Leah says, good fortune has come to me, and the name is Gad. So, like, name your kid after Vegas. That's a good, that's yeah. a good way to go, yeah. I guess. I, that's, it, is, it is a way. I'll say <laughs> it that. Is a it way. is a way to go, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that is an important theme throughout Scripture is that the names, and then God sets this forward, that God sets those names to be very important. Now, Brady, I'm not even sure what that exactly means. So I, I'm going to have to ask my parents. I don't think there's a reason. But Joshua... That has significance. Tell us about it. Uh, yeah, so uh, it means the Lord saves. And so that uh, going forward, uh, certainly Joshua with the uh, um, the way into Canaan for God's people and yep. clearing the way and uh, setting that path to reclaim or to claim or to reclaim uh, the land for God's people. Uh, and then uh, ultimately, you know, you take that forward. And when you get into the New Testament, uh, that is kind of the Hebrew version of what uh, Jesus' name is going to be. So uh, I thank my parents for that. It's a very, it's a strong name, as we say. So Absolutely. I'm, I'm very thankful for that. I just have Tom Brady. That's yeah. all I got. That's all I got. Not everybody is thrilled about that. <laughs> so, Pastor, before we move on, anything else you want to cover in those first 13? Uh, we better keep moving, man. All right, We're here get we go. Down. Well, let's go. Verse 14, and we'll continue on. In the days of wheat harvest, Reuben, there he is, see, we found Reuben again, went and found mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. But she said to her, it is a small matter that you have taken away my husband. 
Would you take away my son's mandrakes also? <laughs> what are we doing here? <laughs> Rachel said, then he may lie with you tonight in exchange for your son's mandrakes. That's not good. When Jacob came from the field in the evening, Leah went out to meet him and said, you must come into me for I have hired you with my son's mandrakes. So he lay with her that night and God listened to Leah and she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. Leah said, God has given me wages because I gave my servant to my husband. So she called his name Issachar. And Leah conceived again, and she bore Jacob a sixth son. Then Leah said, God has endowed me with a good endowment. Now my husband will honor me because I have borne him six sons. So she called his name Zebulun. After she bore a daughter and called her name Dinah. Then God remembered Rachel. I listened to her and opened her womb. She conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. And she has called his name Joseph, saying, May the Lord Yahweh add to me another son. So in the first 13 chapters, excuse me, verses, we have some envy, back and forths, and it seems here that mandrakes are a big deal. Um, and I think Mandrake, isn't that part of Harry Potter in some way? I'm a, uh, ah, oh boy, that's, that's not Bible trivia. I tell you what, if you were to ask me about the 1987 to 1990, 1993 twins, I got it right away. But Harry Potter, I don't have it. But my daughter said it's in Harry Potter. Okay. You don't know that either, though? Uh, I'm not a huge Harry Potter guy. Oh, I know geez. that. We're trying here. Yeah, I know that back uh, <laughs> when they, at the time, once again, when we are talking about the other cultures in that day and time, uh, the Mandrake thing was kind of leaked to superstitious stuff, fertility. Yeah. And so that would make sense that the, and then, like, we got these two adult sisters arguing about who gets to have the mandrakes. Like, they used to, like, kids arguing over the Lincoln Logs or something. Uh, <laughs> and so, uh, but that's something Rachel really wants because uh, to this point, Rachel doesn't have children. And so she's buying into some of these superstitions of the day. And, uh, but it's weird that, like, one of the kids has the mandrakes. Like, what are we doing here? I don't know. But mm. uh, it's, it's, uh, it, it is interesting. And uh, it, you see, though, that the desire here for Rachel is that she's kind of willing to do anything mm. uh, in order to, to have children, to give Jacob children. And I think, you know, in our world today, it's definitely something where you say, um, you know, th this is a very emotional thing. I mean, this yeah. is not a simple thing where you're not able to have children and in and, 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 and a family for a husband and a wife in their situations. And so we definitely sympathize with what's happening. At the same time, it, no one can say this is a godly way of approaching everything. And by the way, mandrakes, I, I saw a picture of it this morning. It's kind of this freaky, like, little, if you ever look at one, it actually looks like a freaky little um, little monster looking at you, too, by the way. So that's not good either. Um, but anyway, so looking at this, we understand all the, the frustrations that are there. But once again, we got Zebulun. We got Issachar. Uh, the Lord is still providing for his people. As we know today, he continues to provide as well. So, Pastor, anything? Well, before we get to, uh, uh, before we get to Joseph here, uh, anything before verse 21 that you want to highlight? Yeah, it's just um, this, is, this is all, as we've been alluding to, this is all very dysfunctional. And uh, it looks like very clearly Jacob does not have control of his household in any way, shape, or form. And we've got the wives fighting, and we've got kids coming from all these different people and everything. It's just Dr. Phil would have a heart attack if he saw this. That's how bad it is. Uh, and so uh, we're, we're going down this path and, and seeing all this crazy stuff. And uh, it's, it's, it's fun, if nothing else, uh, <laughs> to uh, kind of observe it in that way, in that kind of train wreck kind of way that, that we do sometimes. So then it says in verse 22, then God remembered Rachel. Yeah. And we don't exactly know why then. Like you just, okay, all right, I feel bad for her. Here we go. We don't know, but it's, it's an important, I think, aspect of this whole chapter is that God remembered his people and provided for them, even though the many failures they had beforehand, opened her womb and she bore a son. Now we haven't uh, and called his name. Joseph. Now, Jason, Joseph's going to be a very important person throughout the rest of um, the Old Testament. So any, any thoughts on finally Rachel is able to have a son? Yeah, and that's, you know, despite all of the weirdness and their machinations where they're trying to force God's hand in everything, I like the emphasis in verse 22 that it says, then God remembered Rachel and God listened to her and opened her womb. And there's that emphatic you know, the Lord's mentioned twice there to just say, like, 
they were playing all these other games with all this other stuff and the bickering and the fighting and, and everything else. And uh, I just, like, I think about the, um, you know, the interplay between two sisters who are fighting. And it's just, oh, well, it's, it's too bad that you don't have. I just had another kid. It's too bad that you don't yeah. have any kids. I'm up to six. How many do you have? Yeah. yeah right. Yeah. Right. And, uh, but this <laughs> idea then that, that God remembered Rachel. And, and, and this is a grace thing that God shows grace to Rachel. And, when, whenever we see that word remember, that's an important thing. That's a really important mm-hmm. part of uh, Jewish culture and their practices, just that God remembers us and we remember the things that God has done for us. And, and we adopt that too, I, I think, and I yeah. hope, because that those, those things are so important, knowing that the Lord uh, has us in mind. It's not always on our time. It, it's on his time. And uh, he remembers us, and so we would do well to remember all these good things that he has done for us as well. And he remembers us better than we remember things. That's for sure. The ironic thing is he remembers everything, but yet he forgets our sins on account of the blood of Christ, which is always an amazing thing as I think about that. And as we look at this, is that one, God remembered her. She conceived, bore a son, and she says, God has taken away my reproach. And then she continues to pray. So that is this aspect where we don't want to look at the patriarchs and matriarchs of the Old Testament as people without faith. We clearly see this in Hebrews chapter 11, where people, we might wonder at times if they had faith, but clearly they did, just like you and I, but we probably need a a lot of grace in that faith process. So, Pastor, with about a minute left before our break, what are your thoughts as we look at that? Yeah, I really appreciate that you referred to grace right there and this idea here that God has taken away my reproach. There's echoes of that in the New Testament uh, when Elizabeth uh, is going to have John the baptizer, and she says, the Lord has taken away my disgrace. That's mm. the opposite of great. Like, in showing ah, me grace, yes. he's taken away my disgrace. And that happens here with Rachel, and it happens later in the New Testament. I just, I love it when those dots connect and everything, and it just, it, it amplifies the, the grace that the Lord shows us. Very good. Now, Pastor, I'm going to do this as his question now, is this is a real messy story. This is probably... Did you learn this in Sunday school? I don't. Uh, I it was not on the flannel graph. It was, it was not on the flannel graph. And, but yet, I think it's important, especially as we're surrounded by youth right now, because we can read the Bible and say, I just want to read the nice stories. I want to read the memorable stories. And I kind of want to cut it off there. Well, what would your encouragement be for our youth or our listeners to say why this is an important text for us to read where, um, you know, it's part of who we are as Christian people? Why is it important? Yeah, I think, I referenced it earlier, we, we do get the shortcomings of these people in the Old Testament. Uh, it points us forward to the shortcomings of people in the New Testament, and ultimately it points us to our own shortcomings and reminds us that just as Rachel was in need of grace and Jacob and Leah and the whole, our whole crew here are in need of grace, we are in need of grace too. And so it, it calls us all the more back to the Lord uh, to listen to him and to receive the good gifts that he gives to us through Jesus. All right, well, we need to take our break. We are studying Genesis chapter 30 with Pastor Joshua Kanipa, and we'll be right back. These are the voices of young Lutherans in Mexico City, children who are excited to learn more about their Savior, Jesus. But they need our help, because good Lutheran books for kids in the Spanish language are in short supply in Mexico. To learn how you can help tell Spanish-speaking kids everywhere about Jesus in a language they can understand, go to the Lutheran Heritage Foundation website at lhfmissions.org forward slash Juan 316. And welcome back. We are studying Genesis chapter 30 with Pastor Joshua Kanipa live from Houston, Texas at the LCMS Youth Gathering. Um, and we are celebrating the theme in all things from Colossians chapter 1, reminding us that our Lord is in all things. He created all things and he is obviously here to forgive us of our sins. The redemption that is the forgiveness of sins. And so Pastor Kanipa, we are in Texas. You're a Texan. I just, I know every time I meet a Texan, they want me to remind the world 
that they are a Texan. So I'm doing that for you right now. So, you know, I'm used to flying to these things. I'm used to, like, taking a few 24-hour bus trips. But you don't have very far to go. So tell us about your travels here. Taking yeah. a horse. Did you take a horse here? Uh, we did take horses. No, we didn't take horses. <laughs> um, no, we were, we were blessed to be uh, very close locally uh, here to the site of the gathering, which, as you're saying, isn't always the case, but sometimes it is. Yeah. You had a short jog last time when it was in Minneapolis. I did. That wasn't too bad for you. So it was easy. We kind of traded off. So we are about two hours east of downtown Houston. So oh. we were able to do it with just parent drivers, drop us off downtown. They forget about us for, for a few days, and we just get to do our thing here. We're, our hotel's about a mile away from the convention center, so a lot of walking, but walking is good. And, it is. And uh, we're just enjoying our time here, and uh, it's great, man. I'll tell you one quick thing. Uh, uh, Mr. Andy Bates here on KFU and I went for a run this morning in Houston, Texas, and I tell you what, running in Houston at 5 in the morning is not that much fun. What do, you, kinda, what do you think? Why, did, why, didn't, why weren't you there? Yeah. I think we invited you. Yeah, you did. Uh, it's just <laughs> with the humidity, well, by the time I get to Houston, it's less running and it's more swimming. And uh. so that's, uh, that's not what I'm doing these days. All right. Um, well, next, next uh, uh, youth gathering, maybe so. we'll be running with you. Yes. All right. Very good. So let's continue on in our text. Uh, we are now looking at, uh, well, They've kind of solved the issue, if you will. They have all these load of kids. Now it's kind of like, okay, I want, I want to go back home. And so we're going to see how that unfolds. And I'm not sure if the soap opera gets better or not, because it still is a soap opera after all. So, okay, verse 25. As soon as Rachel had born Joseph, Jacob said to Laban, who's his father-in-law, send me away that I may go to my own home and country. Give me my wives and my children for whom I have served you, that I may go. For you know the service that I have given you. But Laban said to him, If I found favor in your sight, I have learned by divination that the Lord Yahweh has blessed me because of you. Name your wages and I will give it. Jacob said to him, You yourself know how I have served you and how livestock has fared with me. For you have had little before I came, and it is an increase abundantly, and the Lord Yahweh has blessed you wherever I turned. But now when shall I provide for my own household also? He said, What shall I give you? Jacob said, You should not give me anything. If you will do this for me, I will again pasture your flock and keep it. Let me pass through all your flock today, removing it from every speckled and spotted sheep and every black lamb and spotted and speckled among the goats and they shall be my wages so my honesty will answer for me later when you come to look into my wages with you everyone that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and black among the lambs if found with me shall be counted stolen laban said good let it be for you as you have said but that day Laban removed the male goats that were striped and spotted and all the female goats that were speckled and spotted, every one that had white on it and every lamb that was black and put them in charge of his sons. Then he, and he set a distance of three days' journey between himself and Jacob, and Jacob pastured the rest of Laban's flock. Oh, my head is absolutely spinning. I'm seeing, um, you know, we got the trickster thing going on here again. Um, and a little bit of like, uh, I don't want anything, but I'll take this, 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 and that. So, Pastor, help us understand this. Yeah, so we've got this thing where Jacob, as you mentioned, he's ready to go and do his own thing. Uh, we've had Joseph. Finally, we had Rachel, Jacob's beloved wife, who has had a son. And so now Jacob says... It's time for me to go. And so he, he wants to go kind of chart his own path. Finally, he's a, he's a bit of a late bloomer here, if we can say it, Pastor yeah. Fenner. Yeah, I But you're right. uh, he's going to go and says, kind of just says, you've ripped me off now for 14 years, 15 years, wherever we're at right now. Yeah. You've ripped me off for a long time, and I'm ready to go, and I want to take some things with me. And we get this mention of divination, which is always a good thing. It's like, well, the demons tell me I should do this. Oh, okay. Well, maybe we'll go along with that. <laughs> Not so much. No. Um, but So we saw some of that with Rachel wanting to have our favorite uh, things, the mandrakes. And now we have it here with, yeah. with Laban. And uh, just uh, 
a reminder for us, man, Christianity is not about spirituality. It is about Jesus. It That's is not right. about all these other, all this other foolishness. And foolishness is, is a light word for it. Like th th there are real spiritual powers and presences that exist in this world. Uh, all the more reason for us to go back to Jesus and, and mm. see what he would have us do. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we've got Jacob and he says, look, you, you didn't have that many animals before, but now you have lots of animals. Like I've done a good job with this. Maybe he went to Texas A&M and learned animal husbandry there. Hmm. I don't know. But now the flocks have done really well. And he says, uh, I've done a good, I've done good for you. I, I, I think you owe me some things. And so that's what it's going to look like. Laban is rich. Jacob is poor. Jacob knows he has to provide for his family. And so they go back and forth. Laban counter offers again. It, it's just, it's all over the place. And that's one of the interesting dynamics to this is that it's like, okay, I, I learned by divination, as you said, that the Lord has blessed me because of you. So you have all these dynamics and, and you look at it and it's amazing to me how, um, uh, you know, Laban, Laban's not crazy because he knows yeah, you're right. Maybe I don't want you to go because I'm kind of liking all this flock here. I like my daughters being around. I get to see my grand grandsons, my granddaughter. All this is right there. And so he says, okay, what do you want? Kind of like a wink, wink, nudge, nudge type of thing going on here as well. Is that kind of what's happening? Yeah, you know, he kind of pitches it as you were just saying in verse 28. Name your wages and I will give it. It's like, to keep you around, I'll even give you a raise. You know, you can... <laughs> To, to keep you here, perhaps for some of the reasons that you're saying. But then uh, Jacob comes and, and he kind of has a counter offer and says, look, uh, I'll take, you know, I'll take the speckled and spotted. I'll take the striped. And with the way the animals were viewed, he's kind of saying, like, I'll take the, the, the second cut. You know, I'll take the bottom of the uh -huh. barrel. I'll take the ones you don't want as much. I'm willing to take that to get away from you, which, which is an interesting Pretty much. Thing I mean, too. that's what it feels like, yeah. is it not? Yeah. Yeah. And so it's okay. So he says he agrees upon that. I mean, it, it, it seems to me that he's good. Let it be as you have said. So this is an agreement. It doesn't say they shook hands. It doesn't say anything along those lines. But then this is where it gets a little confusing. As we look at this, I just encourage our listeners to, well, sharpen your sharpen your ears a little bit, sharpen your uh, your eyes. But verse 35 but that day Laban removed the male goats that were striped and spotted and all the female goats that were speckled and spotted. Every one that had white on it and every lamb that was black and put them in charge of his sons. Then he said a distance of three days journey between himself and Jacob and Jacob's pasture, the rest of Laban's flock. What is going on there? It's a little bit like, are we, what, what is he doing? What's Laban doing? Yeah, so Jacob even says, as we mentioned, I will take the less valuable ones. Like we're at a Chevy dealership. I'll take a Ford. <laughs> and <laughs> you're never going to get any sponsors. No, we're not. I don't think I, I haven't heard any hoop and hollers off that clamoring one. for that. But here, Laban's cheating. He's hiding. You know, they kind of make this deal. He's hiding the sheep uh, from from Jacob. And uh, it's it's not cool. And why is he doing that? What do you think? I think he's doing it because it could be this thing of, you know, he didn't want him to leave. So if, you know, the speckled and the spotted, if you can't find any, then you don't have anything. You don't have enough money to go where you want to go. So maybe he will just stick around and right. continue to do. You know, it says apparently he's very good at getting the flock to multiply in a, in a way that is beneficial to him. It's just perhaps another trick to get Jacob to stay close by, keep working for me, keep making my flock successful, uh, all that kind of stuff. It's interesting, too, because the meaning of Laban's name, back to my nerdy stuff, yes. uh, is white. And so uh, mm. we'll get to that here in a minute with the sticks and all that, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But uh, when it talks about which sheep he wants to keep and all that stuff, this, this is this is Laban with his, with his deal. And it's interesting, too, because um, he... <laughs> It would be interesting to find out more about Laban's faith. It appears that he is definitely a man of faith, but also, like you said, he's kind of a trickster, him and Jacob, you know, going back. We don't have anything later on in Scripture that says, by the way, this Laban guy was a man of faith. 
So it kind of leaves us a little bit of an uncomfortable position because he seems to always be doing things that are counter God. And, and that's one of my, you know, one of my struggles too, is that when we, um, for example, you do a funeral or you, you know somebody that we understand when someone's in church and they come to receive communion, that they understand their own sins. Um, at the same time, those who don't go, it kind of causes some grief in our hearts because you're like, wow, we want them to be in the, in receiving the gifts because then we know that they know they need a Savior. So, Pastor, I'm kind of always left with a little bit with Laban, some, how do you say it, Un- discomfort. I'll say it that way. So what are your thoughts on that and how that relates to the church today? Yeah, you know, I do see Laban. We, in the Bible, we see... We see flaws and we see positive things. And with Laban, it seems like we mostly see flaws. Uh, yeah. He seems to be a pretty dishonest guy. We might say he's a shrewd guy. Uh, and so, um, yeah, it, it can be hard to see some of that some of that good stuff going on with him. So, I don't know. He, he was related to, you know, the, the Jacob family line and all that mm-hmm. stuff. So there's some connection there, and he seems to know some good things to do, but they've also got all this other weird spirituality mixed in, and that, uh, that you're right, it does. It leaves us with a lot of questions about, about their, their disposition and all that stuff. And so what should we as, as Christian people today, we all have family members who are not involved in the church, um, disconnected. We're just not quite sure. What, what's your encouragement to our listeners as we kind of struggle with, with those who are not necessarily living the faith that we wish they would. Yeah, and that can be really heartbreaking stuff, as we all know, because you know, I think anybody within the sound of our voices uh, has echoes of that somewhere in their family. And uh, there's always a black sheep, uh, perhaps, we, we might say, in the context of this story. But, um, you know, the first thing that we're called to do is to pray, because we place it into the Lord's hands. Uh, and in fact, what one of the things that I tell just very simply when I'm talking to kids about things like witnessing and sharing your faith and stuff, uh, I give them just a very simple starting formula. First of all, you talk to Jesus about people, and whether that's people in general or a specific person, first talk to Jesus about people, prayer, study, scripture, um, psalms, all this stuff, and then talk to people about Jesus, which is your opportunity then to share what Jesus has done in your life um, and just try to continue both of those in, in tandem, in order, but also they, they both kind of go together. And um, that's the way that I kind of put out there as a starting point. Yeah. But you're right, when you've been doing that for years or decades and you don't see any fruit happening, that, that can be a very frustrating and saddening thing. And that's why when you look at Second Timothy chapter 4, which has been a lot of fun as, as district president to be able to install and ordain uh, pastors, to install teachers, uh, DCE even, um, to be able to you, you talk about that, that language in Second Timothy chapter 4. It says, preach the word, be ready in season, out of season. And that's an important aspect to it because it doesn't say, uh, preach the word and guess what? You're going to see a lot of fruit every single time you do it. And, and all your kids are going to stick with it. Um, all your kids are just going to, you know, they're going to just go on the gravy train with biscuit wheels, my favorite line, by the way. Um, and you'll see that all happen in your life. But we do know that God does bear fruit. And that's one of the joys of being here at the youth gathering is that we see, uh, uh, well, obviously friends. That's always fun. Pastor Knipp and I go back to seminary days. Um, and the, But you also see all these young people who are, like, for example, we have all these sessions that, that these kids can go to. And guess what? They're going. Like, this is not, they're, they're skipping and going to a movie. At least I don't think they are, are they? I don't think they are. Um, I probably did that when I went to the youth gatherings. But, but they're there. They want to hear the word of God. They want to know what this means to be a, 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 young, a young lady in Christ, a young man in Christ, to hear the word of God, Bible study, everything else in between. So that, that's, to me, this is one of the beauties of Genesis 1, 30, 30 and 31 that we'll see tomorrow is, guess what? God is still at work, even in the midst of what might not seem like it. So, Pastor, any reflections on that as we sit at the youth gathering? Yeah, no, you're reminding me. I just, on the walk over here, I had a conversation with one of my young ladies in my group, and we were talking about one of the sessions that she attended yesterday. And um, she said, for the one session, she's like, I didn't really feel like it was for me because it's talking about stuff that I haven't, like, I'm only 15, and I, I don't... Uh, I haven't thought about some of these other things that are ahead of me in life. 
And, uh, you know, my encouragement to her is, uh, look, it's helpful and beneficial for you to think about those future things when you're 15 because when you come to those difficult decision points and you know you have a choice of going right or left or right or wrong either one um, it's good that you've thought about it ahead of time because you don't want to have to make a big decision like that in the moment instead you can say you know what we've already decided what we're going to do here and that's what that kind of thing can look at and going to a gathering like the one that our church puts together uh, invites kids to have those thoughts and to look forward and to uh, lay the groundwork for when those big decisions are going to be made. And it's always powerful to be able to see, and with the theme, in all things, yes, we know the Lord is always there, but we also see the fruit that's being born, that you're not alone in faith, that there are people across the country, around the world, I mean, there's people around the world here as well, that are, are confessing Jesus as Lord and... Um, you know, we might not always look like it. That's, that's right. Repentance and forgiveness of sins always needs to be preached as we look at um, our lives. So, uh, Pastor, we've gone through the first 36 verses of chapter 30. Um, anything else you wanted to highlight? Not just yet. i got one thing I'm saving for the end. <laughs> All right, so, let's keep plowing yeah. along here. Verse 37 until the end of chapter 30. Then Jacob took fresh sticks of poplar and almond and plane trees and peeled white streaks in them exposing the white of the sticks. He set the sticks that he peeled in front of the flocks in the troughs, that is, the watering places, where the flocks came to drink. And since they bred when they came to drink, the flocks bred in front of the sticks. And so the flocks brought forth striped, speckled, and spotted. And Jacob separated the lambs and set the faces of the flocks toward the striped and all the, the black and the flock of Laban. He put his own droves apart and did not put them with Laban's flock. Whenever the strong of the flock were breeding, Jacob would lay the sticks in the troughs before the eyes of the flock that they might breed among the sticks. But the feebler of the flock, he would not lay them there. So the feebler would be Laban's and the stronger Jacob's. Thus the man increased greatly and had large flocks, female servants and male servants, and camels and donkeys. I tell you what, Laban has met his match. What do you got for us? What is going on here, man? We got sticks. This was my little note about maybe the play on words with Laban because he's exposing the white part of the sticks. Yes. And... It results in not Laban getting over, but with Jacob getting over uh, and getting ahead because the uh, the animals that he's going to get to have are the ones with the, you know, what, what at the time they would say are blemishes, you know, the spots and the stripes and, right. and all this kind of stuff. And uh, here, though, Jacob hits the jackpot. And we get this explanation here that he this thing happened and he did this, and this is kind of especially 43 there, that's the man increased greatly and had large flocks. And, you know, this is one of the favorite, uh, I would say, miss readings of Scripture that you'll hear the prosperity preachers use. And yeah. they put that out there, just do this and want this and desire for this and you will get it. And so you name it and you claim it and you blab it and you grab it and you shake it and you bake it and somehow everything comes through for you. And that is not the way that it's necessarily going to work for you. God has spoken into some of those kinds of situations, but uh, certainly here for Jacob, uh, he, he, the tables turn back around on Laban, and uh, it's, a, it's a neat deal. It's a funny story. I don't know. I'm not I, an I, expert. It's absolutely amazing. So we kind of think that, that, um, that Laban had the upper hand. He figured it out. Now Jacob's just going to be like, you know what, I'm moving on. But then he found a way to come out ahead once again. I do want to take a step back here because you had a good line there that I want to write down, and I think it's good for our listeners to have, is, uh, and this is what we don't like. So name it and claim it, I always end there. But you said, was it blab it and grab it? Absolutely. What's the other? There was one more. Oh, I said uh, shake it and bake it. That was a joke. <laughs> shake um, it and bake it. It's shake and bake. Nah, hell. <laughs> I love it. So this is not what we believe, by the way. If anybody's yes. hearing this, this is not thus says <laughs> the Lord. But it is good for us to say and maybe maybe a little snark when we're looking bit. at health and wealth. But, Pastor, what's the big deal? We say, you know what, I want that. I'm going to pray for that. God gives it to me. What's the problem with us living that kind of life? What would you say? Well, because you assume too much. Uh, you are assuming that you know 
exactly what you should have in what time you should have it. Uh. And you are putting that upon the Lord and telling him this is how things should be. And that might not be your story right now. And right. Uh, we're talking a little bit about that here at the gathering, about what your story is and, and that the Lord is with you begin, beginning, middle and end in your story. And uh, it's a part of a greater story that is the story of Jesus, history, as we call it, his story. And so uh, we play a part in that. So you can say, well, Jacob just said this and God prospered him. Or you could say, well, you know, he worked with integrity and honesty for however many years for Laban and now God is paying back his wages. Well, maybe it is God bringing about justice on that situation. Right. Um, but, you know, it is not for you to interpret. It's not for me and it's not for us to interpret, interpret what God is doing uh, in certain situations and everything. It, it, it assumes too much if you think that, that this is some kind of formula that right. is going to work for you. And that's an important aspect that we've talked about continuously here on Thy Strong, where it is we have to be very careful in how we interpret Scripture because we can easily read the story and go, oh, that's what I'm going to do, shake it and bake it. Uh, that's kind of the goal here. But for us to be able to look at that and realize that this is something that God shows us. And there's sometimes, I want to highlight, highlight this too in verse 43, is that, um, that what I wish it said, now there's times we have to be careful with this, so just be, we got to be careful with this, is that... There's times in Scripture, and I want to hear your thoughts, Pastor, is I wish it was a little more clear. Because what would be nice is if it says something along the lines of, thus the Lord increased greatly and had large flocks, or something like, for his family, or um, on account of his faith, or something along those lines. You kind of wish that God would insert those words, right? Because then it would be a little more clear on what he, why he's doing it. But he doesn't. Any, any thoughts on... Sometimes we wish it, God's word says something differently, but we still have to have faith in what God gives us. Yeah, and that's all the more reason that we can't assume and we can't put our own kind of spin or desires or whatever into the pages of Scripture. And, uh, you know, we've had fun with some of this this morning and told some jokes here, Brady, but uh, it, it, it is, it's a very serious thing. The Lord's, the Lord's word is very serious, and we are called to hear and to heed that which he has given us. Uh, not to put our own spin on things and, and all of that. And that's why this is important for us, too, because when we talk about where youth are at, young adults are in their lives, they need to see a, a story like this. And we say it, true story in, in, in history that happened because we can get this really weird idea that, oh, they were closer to creation, therefore... It was the good old days. It's kind of like how we have a nostalgic, like, 1950s. There wasn't many problems, but all of a sudden they arrived magically when Pastor Knipp and I were born. All of a sudden, everything went downhill around those times. <laughs> and so it's important for our youth and young people, adults, everybody, to read a story like this. Any encouragement you have um, for everyone? Because, like I said, it's not in the Sunday school book, but yet it's important for us to know. Why is it important? So what I like about this story is, uh, as we've mentioned, it does point to... Um, what I like to look at is that we see God's sovereignty play out in the stories of the patriarchs and mm. in each individual story, you know, ultimately, as we said, was God giving justice for Jacob in the midst of, uh, you know, Laban's double crosses on Jacob were pretty big uh, when it comes to the two wives and, and then the, all the sin that came out of that going forward. Um, but we did see that God remembered Rachel. and. In God remembering Rachel, we got Joseph, who ultimately is in the line of Jesus Christ. He's one of the most important uh, figures in all of Scripture. Uh, the 12 tribes of Israel come out of the 12 sons that Jacob has, and then um, Joseph goes forward. And it's a reminder, too, that the Lord is always working, and Jesus himself comes from this crazy family line. Uh, so it is ultimately for our blessing that this weird thing happened with these real people in history. And that's, well, that's a good reminder for all of you, our listeners, and for all of our youth and all and come, come together in his name, is that reality is that God remembers you. Um, he he uh, has forgiven you of your sins, which means he forget your sins. He, he, he cleansed you of those sins. And therefore, we always know that there is hope. 
And that's one of the great things that I'm seeing over and over again in our youth gathering is that that reminder to our young people that not like, hey, if you just do this, this, and this, guess what? You're going to have just a great life ahead of you, which is what culture says, right? I mean, they had a great skit the other night um, where they're just talking about all these different voices that we're hearing from people, your coach, your family, your friends, your church, all of this that kind of like just drowns out where it's white noise eventually, where we forget our identity. And that's why I love how we look at this in that sense. So pastor, what are your last thoughts? We have two minutes left. Yeah, just one thing I wanted to clarify. Uh, Jesus ultimately comes from the line of Judah, um, I'm which, sorry, yes. which actually causes it to be a more uh, it causes the story to be more filled with grace because Judah was one of Leah's sons. Leah, the wife right. uh, who was, I mean, can we say hated? He certainly didn't love her the way that he loved. Uh, uh, it, jo- it, it, uh, it Jacob did not way. love Leah the way he loved Rachel. Um, and so um, he didn't show her the kindness that he showed uh, Rachel. And, and Jacob didn't respect and mete out justice and mercy and all these things when it came to his family. But the Lord does. Mm. And the Lord did. And I tell you what, I would challenge you, our listeners, to continue to think of that um, narrative, how God, God works through even the worst of situations. So, Pastor, less than a minute left in our time. How would you encourage our listeners? Um, how, what would you summarize our chapter and encourage our listeners in Christ? I would say that we are reminded that ultimately, and it does fit in well with our theme here, is that we have this story that God is at work in all things. So God is at work in us when we are at our best. God is at work in us when we are at our worst. And when we look at this crazy family here, there's some definite low points that are there, but know that with God working in all things, God is working in this story as well. And ultimately, uh, bro, we're going to get 12 sons here. And in Revelation 21, we're going to have a city that has 12 gates that represents the 12 tribes of Israel. Mm. And uh, it is going to be God bringing about new heaven and new earth. Uh, and he is the one who wins. Jesus is the one who is the hero. And he conquers all he conquers sin and death does so on the cross and we're the ones who benefit from it and we're the ones who are blessed and we're so thankful for all of that pastor joshua Knippa of holy cross lutheran church in Nederland, texas giving us god's strong word from genesis chapter 30 pastor Knippa, it's you know what it's a joy to be with you face to face on radio thank you for bringing us his gifts Thank you so much, Pastor Finner. God bless. I'm your host, Pastor Brady Finner, District President of the Minnesota North District of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. Thank you for joining us, and the Lord keep you safe in the palm of his hands.